aboard the Queen Elizabeth for the first of her trips across the Atlantic carrying Canadian repast. Movement control personnel of 150 officers and 900 other ranks act as guides as the orderly procession moves up the gangplanks into the Leviathan with clockwork regularity. In the first of a series of repat sailings, the 85,000 ton troop ship is loaded for the voyage to Halifax, which will take four days. On the return trip, she will carry British troops from the Far East, who will be brought across Canada to divert by rail. Dead on schedule, the homeward trip commences. A cheery bon voyage has given the parting Canucks as the many operations are effected to get the great ship safely on her way. On an ebbing tide, with the sun breaking through the clouds, the flag-dressed gray liner with the Cunard white star colors on her funnels moves downstream. Ten tugboats rocked by the giant battle stiff stern winds to guide her into open water. On November the 4th, the Queen will return to Southampton to carry another mighty draft of Canadians to Halifax, aiding fulfillment of the repat motto, All Home by April. Number two, Canadian Special Infantry Battalion are on parade on the square of Old Dean Common Camp, Hampshire. Lieutenant General Murchie, Chief of Staff, greets Colonel Patterson, OC of the highly trained unit, and inspects the battalion prior to a ceremony of presentation. A drum given originally to number 13 Canadian General Hospital by the citizens of Hamilton, Ontario, is represented to two CSIDs who take it in charge for safekeeping. As part of the Thanksgiving week ceremonies, the unit marches to Camberley, whose mayor presides at a demonstration by the Canadian Battalion specializing in drill and ceremonies, two CSIB. In Alberta, major miner and independent oil producers are working together, as in wartime, to meet the urgent need for more oil fields in western Canada. Turner Valley, when the war started, turned out a large percentage of Canada's annual crude oil quota of nearly 8 million barrels. One new field alone is tapping yields at a rate comparable with all Turner plants. A surveying party taps the Alberta subsoil to chart the underground makeup and determine the location of oil deposits. Explosive charges are dropped in the hole. Special portable recording apparatus charts the seismic waves as they reflect from various strata when the charge is fired. From resultant graphs are drawn up contour maps of the subsurface structure. These limit the margin of error to which the driller is subject as he probes for oil. Materials are assembled for erecting the derrick. The huge power unit which will turn the drill is unloaded and quickly mounted in position. For penetrating the earth, drill piping tipped with a drill head is used. 45-foot lengths of 3-inch steel pipe force their way through the earth. As the oil strata is reached, flame, smoke and gas issue from the flare pipe and the gusher gets strictly operational. trucks and pipelines to the refinery work overtime to handle the output. Every available bit of storage space is used to handle the precious fluid, even to pits dug in the earth. Mushroom towns spring up all over the province to supply the oil men as they constantly shift their location from one well to the next. In the eternal search for oil, the drillers move practically with their homes on their backs. Methods of transportation range all the way from ancient Henry's to the reliable old gray mare. Shopping on horseback in scenes reminiscent of gold rush days are an everyday occurrence to these pioneers of 1945. With more and more gasoline needed to turn the wheels of empire trade, Canada is playing her part in high-pressure production of the Alberta oil boom. In Aurich, Germany, the famous brass band of the CWAC serenade the opening of the Brems Gardens Recreational Center. Designed for the entertainment of CAOF personnel, it is officially opened by Brigadier Gibson of the 7th Canadian Brigade. As is customary on opening night, everything's on the house. 
Auxiliary services supervisors, utilizing German labor, have done a good job in remodeling what was once a Jerry residence. Now a strictly posh hangout for occupational troops on leave, it gets away to a good start, especially in the hash department. For the indoor athletes, there are all kinds of games to while away the tedious hours in Jerryland. So the CAOF is settling down to the job of making life interesting while holding the lid on Jerry. In the Beaver Stadium in Utrecht, 10,000 fans of the bouncing pigskin watch the kickoff in the opening game in the Big Four series of the Canadian Army. The 4th Div Atoms take on the Army Troop Bombers, and the boys in the bleachers are really getting their money's worth as they follow some outstanding play. Captain Orville Burke, coach and quarterback of the Atoms, looms as the outstanding star of the tourney with his plunging and passing, while a runner-up for stellar position is left half bombshell Johnny Downs, who is responsible for three touchdowns. All the glamour of an intercollegiate match is on exhibition, even the female cheerleaders. Some of the heavy line plungers result in casualties, but only of a minor nature, as the paragons of the pigskin eat up the yard. Although the score looks like a victory bond objective at full time, it is not the whole indication of the play. Still, the well-coached collection of four div atoms established themselves as a mighty force to be reckoned with in the Big Four League with their final score, 24 to 1. Hold your hat is good advice when the five div super colossal spectacular roadshow plays your camp. On tour, Northern Holland, the maroon patch masterpiece is strictly operational right down to the bone. All the troopers have played the best places, having had top billing in such spots as Melfa, the Gothic Line, and Otterloo. That accounts for their continental technique, which is laying audiences in the aisles from Appledurn to Point West. Made up entirely from troops wearing the maroon patch, the show, though non-professional, has all the earmarks of an Olson and Johnson slapstick epic. long sought after bathtub for the Canadian Army is now in the transport section and the inland Navy sure is hitting heavy weather. And poor Daisy May is in imminent danger of losing her trade pay. <laughs> On the high bar, Lieutenant Nickling of Hamilton, Ontario, the head man of the show, makes with the calisthenics. When it comes to glamour, what is it that Betty Grable has that Five Div hasn't got? Blue gowned Alice isn't a fugitive from the casino or the Polish Brazier, but she sure reveals the facts of life. With practically every unit of five div represented in the cast, one of the best service concert parties of the war is the Maroon Masterpiece. Hold your hat.